Welcome to this teaching that I'm going to title A Relationship Rekindled by Laura Densmore with Hebrew Nation Radio. The questions that we're going to take a look at in this study is, we're going to take a look at who is Joseph anyway? And how did this ancient split between Judah and Joseph happen? Are Judah and Joseph similar to a married couple that got separated and then divorced? And finally, what will it take for reconciliation to occur? How can this relationship be rekindled? So we take a look at who are we? When you say the word Christian, what do you mean? Hebrew roots people see themselves as having come out of the Sunday Christian church world. They are on a journey and they may have started there, but many have come out of that place. They do not see themselves any longer as Christian. Instead, they identify with Hebrew roots, Messianic, or the children of Joseph, B'nai Yosef, the children of Israel, Ephraim, Joseph, or Jacob. So who are the children of Joseph? We, the Northern Kingdom, the 10 tribes of the North, were taken into captivity into Assyria long ago. We were assimilated into all the nations and we forgot our true identity. We as a people are beginning to wake up from this spiritual amnesia. A veil is being removed. We are beginning to remember who we are. We are developing a group and national identity, B'nai Yosef. And by faith, we see ourselves as the 10 tribes of the Northern Kingdom, the non-Jewish part of Israel. By faith, we see ourselves as the house of Israel, as Ephraim and Joseph. And we have come out from the Sunday church world. We see ourselves as B'nai Yosef, children, descendants of Joseph. How do you recognize Joseph? We keep the Shabbat and the biblical feasts. We eat biblically clean. We strive to keep Torah by the power of the Spirit. We have a deep love for the land of Israel and the Jewish people. We read, study, and follow the Torah reading cycle. We identify with Yeshua as our Messiah. And we have come out of traditional Sunday Christian church settings. And also, there are those who are still in the Sunday church world, and they may be part of Joseph, but they just don't know this yet. Now, there's some things to put on the shelf when we begin to have dialogue and communication with our brother Judah, with the Jewish part of the nation of Israel. There's some things we need to put on the shelf. And we're looking at this little cartoon. On the left, we see an Orthodox Jew, and um, he's thinking in his mind as he's looking at his Christian brother across the aisle, or his brother from the uh, Joseph side of the aisle. If only he would come under the authority of the rabbis, then everything would be okay. Now on the other side of the aisle, from the side of Joseph, as he holds up the Bible, he's thinking out loud, if only he would come to know Yeshua as the Messiah, then everything would be okay. But really, for us to begin to have relationship and dialogue and communication and begin to collaborate and work together, we must operate in a principle called mutual respect. No agenda. Set aside assumptions. Let's put this issue about who the Messiah is, whether he's coming for the first time or coming for the second time. Let's put that on the shelf. Let's talk. Let's build relationship. Let's get to know each other. And may we honor and respect one another and not try to proselytize or missionize the other person on the other side of the aisle. Now, a separation or a divorce is after a couple has been separated for many years or even become divorced, how is it possible that they come back together? Only the Spirit of the Lord can do this. There is broken trust. There is suspicion, doubt, and fear. There's a record of wrongs, offenses, and hurts. We have the Holocaust, the Crusades, the Inquisitions, the pogroms. All of this baggage must be dealt with. Where did this split happen? Where did it first start? It began 
in 1 Kings chapter 12, starting in verse 12 through 16, where it is written, So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king had directed, saying, Come back to me the third day. Then the king answered the people roughly and rejected the advice which the elders had given him. Verse 14. And he spoke to them according to the advice of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. So the king did not listen to the people. For the turn of events was from Yahweh, that he might fulfill his word, which the Lord had spoken by Ahijah, the Shilonite, to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Now when all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king, saying, What share have we in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, now see to your own house, O David. So Israel departed to their tents. This was when and where and how the split happened, dividing the one nation into two nations. Now, where did this split originate? Let's go back to 1 Kings chapter 12. And we had just read verses 12 through 16. This was when and where and how the split happened, dividing the one nation into two. So to the south, we have the southern kingdom of Judah with Rehoboam leading them. And to the north, the ten tribes of the north, we have the house of Israel, also known as the house of Joseph or Ephraim, and they are led by Jeroboam. Now I want to pose a question to you to consider and to think about. I believe this was a download from the Holy Spirit from the Ruach, and I just want to run this by you and you can test and see. Could it be that Joseph and Judah have male and female characteristics? So, you know, there's a really great little YouTube out there. It's called The Tale of Two Brains. It talks about how men's brains work in boxes. They have a box for everything. You get a box for the car, a box for talking about money, a box for talking about your job, a box for talking about the wife and kids. But the rule is the boxes do not touch each other. When a man discusses a particular subject, they pull out that box and they discuss only what is in that box. And then they close the box carefully and put it away. And they're care careful not to touch any other boxes. Men tend to speak from the place of reason and logic, from the head. Women's brains are very different from men's brains. Women's brains are made up of a, like a big ball of wire and everything is connected to everything. Zzz, money is connected to the car and the car is connected to the job and the kids are connected to you and everything is connected to everything. It's like the internet superhighway. It's all driven by high octane energy called emotion. We are all over the map. We tend to be global and we see the big picture. Women tend to speak from the heart. We need each other. We are incomplete without the other. We complement each other. Now let's see how this might apply to Judah and Joseph. Could it be that one of the houses is representative of the male side and the other house is representative of the female side? Let's take a look. With Judah, we see that the Jewish people meticulously scribed and copied and shared the Torah with the nations. The truth and that they are very truth and Torah word centered. They tend to think in boxes and categories and focus on the details. They tend to be focused with logic and reason and they focus on the head. Whereas uh, the Messianic people, the people of Joseph, the house of Joseph, uh, Hebrew roots folks, our spiritual DNA goes right back to Joseph and Joseph was a dreamer and one who had visions. And those visions, when he would communicate them, got him into a lot of trouble with his brothers. They tend to be very spirit-centered. We love to worship and be in the spirit and be led by the spirit. 
um, the Messianic folks, the House of jo Joseph, tends to think all over the map, global, big picture, always looking for connections, and more emotion and feeling based, and they focus on the heart. So let me just put this out here as a hypothesis or a speculation. I think that Judah represents the male side of the equation, and Joseph represents the female sides of the equation. Now, in a Jewish wedding, the bride encircles and walks around the groom seven times, based upon this scripture from Jeremiah 31, verses 21 and 22, where it is written, Set up signposts, make landmarks, set your heart toward the highway, the way in which you went. Turn back, O maiden of Israel, turn back to these cities of yours. Till when would you turn here and there, O backsliding daughter? For Hashem has created what is new on earth. A woman encompasses a man. So how can the two become one? This is a deep mystery. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, it is written, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now how can this be? Does the woman get assimilated and become a clone and become the man? No. Does the man get assimilated, become a clone, and become the woman? No. They each maintain their own unique identity and personality, but in the coming together, they become one. A new identity and personality emerges, who they are as a married couple. Now, how can the two become one? We have Hashem above all, over all, and in all. It's a hupa over all. Hashem is in the midst. He is the tie. He is the connector. He is the bridge. He is the keystone. He is the covering. He brings the holy fire to make this union set apart, kadosh, holy, and full of love. Joseph's identity is wrapped up in relationship to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is where we have common ground. But keep in mind, an integral part of the identity of Joseph is that he has found his way to Hashem, to the Father, to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, through Yeshua. Yeshua was the shepherd who helped this lost sheep find his way back into the fold with the Father. So Joseph cannot deny Yeshua as part of his own identity. It is part of who he is. This is a non-negotiable. So basically we have two sheepfolds, Joseph and Judah, separated by 2,700 years of time, distance, culture, and lifestyle. Now I'm going to quote a couple of scriptures from the Brit Hadashah. The first one is John chapter 10, verse 16. Yeshua said he came for the lost sheep of Israel, not the lost sheep of Judah. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, I have to bring them as well, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. And again, in Matthew chapter 15, verse 24, Yeshua said, and he answering said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Notice he's not saying that he was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Judah. He was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And finally, in Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 and 6, it is written, Yeshua told his disciples this, Do not go into the way of the nations, and do not enter a city of the Samaria, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Those were his instructions to his disciples. Who were they to go to? The lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, Hashem will sort it all out in his own good time. We have become two nations, two peoples, two sheepfolds, two sticks. For now, let us draw near to one another. When everything shakes out in the fullness of time, there will be one shepherd who will guide the sheep, Hashem himself, the Father. Now, 
Two sticks become joined. How? What does this mean? What is this long expected reunion between Judah and Joseph? The reunion of the two kingdoms, Northern Kingdom, known as House of Israel or Ephraim, and Southern Kingdom, known as Judah, is prophesied in Ezekiel 37, where it is written that the stick of Judah and the stick of Ephraim would become one in the hand of the Lord. Ezekiel 37, verses 15 to 19, it is written, Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, As for you, son of man, take a stick for yourself and write on it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write on it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. Then join them, one to another for yourself, into one stick, and they will become one in your hand. And when the children of your people speak to you, saying, Will you not show us what you mean by these? Say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Surely I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his companions, and I will join them with it, with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they will become one in my hand. This is wedding talk. This is language similar to what we read in Genesis 2.24, where a man leaves his father and mother and he is joined to his wife. What does it mean to join? Let's zoom in on Ezekiel 37, verse 17. Then join them one to another for yourself into one stick, and they will become one in your hand. Now that word join in Hebrew is karab, and it means to come near, to approach, to enter into, to draw near. So the two sticks, Jude and Ephraim, when they join, it means they draw close. They draw near to each other. It does not mean that Judah becomes Ephraim or that Ephraim becomes Judah. They are to draw near to each other. It is up to the Father to make them into one nation in his way and in his time. So we have a picture of a marriage with a wandering wife who strayed. The house of Israel or Joseph is given a certificate of divorce in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8. And I'll start with verse 6. Hashem said also to me in the days of Josiah the king, Have you seen what backsliding Israel has done? She has gone up on every high mountain and under every green tree, and there played the harlot. And I said, after she had done all these things, return to me. But she did not return. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. Then I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but also went and played the harlot. Joseph is like Gomer. She becomes a harlot and has a spirit of whoredoms, Hosea 4, verse 12. She is joined to idols, Hosea 4, verse 17. The Torah seems strange to her, Hosea 8, verse 12. She forgets the Torah, Hosea 4, verse 6. She rebels against the Torah, Hosea 8, 1 and 2. She forgets God, Hashem, Hosea 2, verse 13. 4, verse 1, and 8, verse 14. She forgets who she is and loses her identity. She becomes not my people, lo ami, Hosea 1, verse 9. And she becomes a wanderer among the nations, Hosea 9, 17. And she mixes with the peoples, Hosea 7, verse 8. But let us hear the heart cry of the Father. Here is his heart cry as he shares, as this is expressed in Hosea chapter 11, verses 8 and 9. How could I give you up, Ephraim? How could I hand you over, Israel? How could I make you like Adma? How could I set you like Seboim? My heart turns within me. All my compassion is kindled. I shall not let the heat of my wrath burn. I shall not turn to destroy Ephraim. 
for I am Elohim and not man. I shall not come in enmity. What will it take for reconciliation to occur? Humility, repentance, teshuvah, asking for forgiveness, extending forgiveness, canceling the record of wrongs. Think about that separated and divorced couple. How is this marriage to be restored? It may seem impossible in the eyes of man, but with the father, nothing is impossible. It requires humility, brokenness, and repentance from both parties. This process is described in Hosea 5, verses 14 and 15, and again in Hosea 6, verses 1 through 4. Hashem is talking to both parties, to both Judah and Joseph. For I am like a lion to Ephraim and like a young lion to the house of Judah. I myself tear them and go. I take them away and there is no one to deliver. I shall go. I shall return to my place until they confess their guilt and seek my face in their distress. Diligently search for me, search for me and say, come and let us turn back to Hashem, for he has torn us, but he does heal us. He has stricken us, but he binds us up. After two days, he shall revive us. And on the third day, he shall raise us up so that we live before him. So let us know, let us pursue to know Hashem. And he comes to us like the rain, like the latter rain watering the earth. Ephraim, what would I do with you? Yehuda? What would I do with you? For your loving commitment is like a morning cloud, and like the early dew, it goes away. So how a relationship develops or is rekindled is you start first by getting to know each other. You become friends. You understand one another. You respect one another. You develop emotional intimacy. You share truth in the inwardmost parts. You become vulnerable and transparent and reveal yourself to the other. You speak the truth in love. And then we have dating, courtship, betrothal, and then marriage. Now I want to go over three repentance truth arrows. Truth arrow number one is going to come from Psalm 19. Truth arrow number two is going to come from Psalm 32. And truth arrow number three will come from Psalm 51. So we must deal with our secret, hidden faults and sins. From Psalm 19, verses 12 and 13, it is written, Who discerns mistakes? Declare me innocent from those that are secret. Also keep your servant back from presumptuous ones. Do not let them rule over me. Then I shall be perfect and innocent of great transgression. We need to pray for the spirit of repentance to come from Hashem. Hashem is the one who sends it. We are blind to our own sin. It is his spirit that convicts us, that reveals the sin, and that brings us to heartfelt genuine, thorough, and deep repentance from the heart, which results in a change in lifestyle and behavior. Us folks from the Ephraim camp, we have much to repent for. We come in humility, in brokenness, knowing that we have been a rebellious people with a spirit of wandering from the Father. We have chased after other lovers. We have been like a harlot. We repent, we repent, and we return. Truth arrow number two from Psalm 32. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom Hashem imputes no crookedness and in whose spirit there is no deceit. I acknowledged my sin to you and my crookedness I did not hide. I have said, I confess my transgressions to Hashem, 
and you forgave the crookedness of my sin. Selah. We must acknowledge our sin, not hide it, not cover it up, not defend it. The wall of pride must come down. If we don't repent of pride, we cannot get to any of the other sin behind that wall. The enemy does not want us repenting. Our self-defense wall comes up and we think I'm right and they are wrong. And pride and self-righteousness gets in the way. We must first repent of pride, confess it, acknowledge it, ask the Father to remove it and purge it out of us. And then we can really get to work on the other sins in our heart and in our life. Truth Arrow, number three, from Psalm 51. See, you have desired truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you make me know wisdom. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I am clean. Wash me, and I am whiter than snow. Create in me a clean heart, O Elohim, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your set-apart spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your deliverance and uphold me by your generous spirit. Against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. So may we have that spirit to be truthful with the Father not hide, not cover up, not pretend, not defend, but be truthful that when we are confronted with our sin, that we will be humble and truly repent of it and turn from it and make things right and make amends. May we be teachable and humble and tell the truth The reconciliation. So after a couple has been separated for many years or even become divorced, how is it possible that they come back together? Only the spirit of Hashem can do this. We must be humble. We must ask forgiveness of one another. We must extend forgiveness. We must not keep a record of wrongs, but begin with a clean slate. We look for a change in behavior. Genuine teshuvah is a change in behavior, a 180 degree turn in the direction that we were walking. There is broken trust. There is suspicion, doubt, fear, a record of wrongs, offenses, hurts. All of this baggage must be jettisoned. I can only repent for me and for my people, but I cannot repent for you. I must repent of the spirit of whoredoms, the idolatry, the unfaithfulness. How can my husband ever forgive me? Yet I pray that he does, that he shows mercy to me and receives me back, even as Hosea took Gomer back and redeemed her off the slave and the auction block. Now there's a prophecy about the restoration of David's tent. And it's in Amos chapter 9, verses 11 to 12. In that day, I shall raise up the tent or booth of David, which has fallen down. And I shall repair or wall up its breaches and raise up its ruins. And I shall build it as in the days of old, so that they possess the remnant of Edom. And all the nations on whom my name is called declares Hashem who does it. How... Do the ruins get raised up? How does a tent get raised up? You need tent poles. Now, how do breaches get repaired? How do gaps get walled up? Intercessors who stand in the gap. A prayer army. In Ezekiel 22, verse 30, it is written, So I sought for a man who would make a wall and stand in the gap before on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. An intercessor is someone who looks at the way a situation is now 
and the way Hashem sees the situation in the future for how he wants it to become. And then they pray into it. In effect, they are walling up the gap through their fervent and passionate prayers. There are at least five major national prayer networks that are praying for Israel on a weekly basis. Hundreds of intercessors are on the wall watching and praying over Israel, over Benjamin Netanyahu, over the IDF, over the Jewish people, over the land and the borders. And they do so fervently with great passion and with tears. Now, when did the tent fall? Recall in 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 16, when Rehoboam and Jeroboam had their split, the final words from Jeroboam or from the people was this. The people answered the king saying, what share do we have in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, now see to your own house, O David. So Israel departed to their own tents. When did the tent fall? I believe it fell at the time of Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Jeroboam rebelled and took the ten tribes of the north with him. Now one time I was going camping and I had a camping trip planned and it was uh, a few years ago in the summer and I had loaned out my tent to my son. He had borrowed it and um, then returned it to me. So I grabbed my tent bag and drove out to my camp spot and when I got to the camping site, there was a tent, but no poles. I could not raise the tent. I had to drive all the way back to town and get poles for the tent. Now, what good is a tent without poles? What good are poles without a tent? Both are needed. We need each other. Now, let's go back to this picture of the fallen tent of David. Could it be that Judah is the tent? Could it be that Ephraim are the tent poles? And could it be that the restoration of David's tent is all about the reunification of Judah and Ephraim? What does it take to raise up a flattened canvas tent? Tent poles. Could it be that Judah is the tent and Ephraim are the tent poles? Both are needed. What does it take to raise up the flattened tent? The poles. Now there's a prophecy of restoration and it's from Amos chapter 9 verses 13 and 14. This is a picture that you're looking at taken from um, the Mount of Blessing, Mount Gerizim, and it's where a great vineyard is and um, looking down upon biblical Shechem, modern day Mablus. Anyway, Amos chapter 9, verses 13 to 14, states this. Look, the days are coming, declares Hashem, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes him who sows seed. And the mountains shall drip new wine, and all the hills melt. And I shall turn back the captivity of my people, Yisrael, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them, and shall make gardens and eat their fruit. This is literally happening now. We see the incredible ministry of Hayovel that Rabbi Yehuda Glick has robustly endorsed. Thousands of Christians over the last decade have come to volunteer in the vineyards near Mount Gerizim to plant, prune, and harvest vines and grapes. And literally, we see world-class wine dripping from the biblical heartland of Judea and Samaria. And the rest of that verse, Amos chapter 9, verse 15, states this, And I shall plant them on their own soil, and not uproot them any more from their own soil that I have given them, says Hashem, your Elohim. The restoration of David's tent is all about the reunification of Judah and Ephraim. David's tent will be restored. For Hashem has promised this in his word. The tent will be raised up again. The poles and the tent canvas will reunite.
In those days, the house of Yehuda shall go to the house of Israel, and they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given as an inheritance to your fathers. Jeremiah 3, verse 18. And in Hosea chapter 1, verse 10, it is written, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which is not measured nor counted. And it shall be in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people. They shall be called, You are the sons of the living Elohim. There is hope. Hashem has promised that this will happen. And in Hosea chapter 3, verse 5, it is written, And afterward the children of Israel shall return and seek Hashem their Elohim and David their king and fear Hashem and his goodness in the latter days. So we see a type and a picture of this when Joseph is reunited with his brothers they did not at first recognize him because he was so Egyptian looking. And there's a day coming in the future, and I can't hardly wait for that day to come, when Joseph and Ephraim of today will reunite as two peoples. Now this picture was taken during Sukkot of 2015 in the Parade of the Nations. There's a little foretaste of what this grand family reunion will be like. And in Hosea chapter 1 verse 11, And the children of Yehuda and the children of Israel shall be gathered together and appoint for themselves one head and shall come up out of the earth, for great is the day of Jezreel. And in Hosea chapter 14 verses 4 through 7, it is written, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned away from him. I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall grow like the lily and lengthen his roots like Lebanon. His branches shall spread. His beauty shall be like an olive tree and his fragrance like Lebanon. Those who dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall be revived like grain and grow like a vine. Their scent shall be like the wine of Lebanon. There's a good ending to this story. This is a remez hint that hints at who these people are. They are the descendants and the children of Joseph. Remember, when Jacob gave his blessing over each of his 12 sons, his blessing to Joseph was this. In Genesis 49, verses 22 to 24, it is written, Joseph is a fruitful bow, a fruitful bow by a well. His branches run over the wall. The archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him, and hated him. But his bow remained in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty Elohim of Jacob. So what was unzipped so long ago between Rehoboam and Jeroboam will be zipped back up by the very hand of Hashem. How does that happen? You catch the zipper into the latch at the bottom and then you pull the tab up and the zipper zips up. One heart at a time. One relationship at a time. As the two sticks draw near to each other. Now, we may not all agree on what this is going to look like or how we are going to get there, but Hashem has promised in his word that he will do it. The two sticks will draw near to each other and become one. And in Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 5, I'll close with this scripture where it is written, And it shall be in the latter days that the mountain of the house of Hashem is established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. And may, many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of Hashem, to the house of the Elohim of Jacob, and let him teach us his ways, 
and let us walk in his paths. For out of Zion comes forth the Torah and the word of Hashem from Yerushalayim. And he shall judge between the nations and shall reprove many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither teach battle any more. O house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the light of Hashem. Abba, I thank you so much for how you are working wondrous things in these days. I can already see your hand moving, Father, as you are bringing people from Joseph and Judah together to work together, to collaborate, to partner together, to stand on the ground that they have in common, to truly walk in mutual respect for one another. Father, continue, please, to do this amazing work because truly we need each other. What good is a bow without arrows? What good are arrows without a bow? What good is a tent without poles? What good are poles without the tent? <laughs> truly, we need each other. So, Father, may you continue to visit your people by your spirit. Put a deep love in our hearts for one another, a deep love for Judah, a deep love for, for Joseph. May we walk in forgiveness. May we walk in grace. May we walk in great honor and respect towards the other side of the aisle. May you accomplish great things in us and through us in these days. Amen.